So the positioning of your brand is really important as you start to think bigger and go, who's someone big that I can partner with? Branding is all about emotion, how you're being perceived. And then once you have that perception, then it's like, okay, what can you do with that? How can you market to that perception from there? If you want to talk bigger level than mindset, it actually comes down to identity. So then if you want to be really strategic, you could be having multiple businesses that are very linked to each other that maybe feed into each other and then create something that's even better, right? Ethan, if there was one message that you'd like people to take away from this conversation, what might it be? If you really want to be successful in business, firstly, it starts with your mindset to get yourself right, removing those limiting beliefs and, and getting those empowering beliefs that you need. Then it's all about the strategies and tactics that you need to implement in all the key areas of business so that you make the right decisions and that you work with the right people and you really create the true wealth and freedom that you desire. So for those who haven't encountered your work yet, perhaps you could share a little bit about who you are and your journey. Yeah, definitely. So I'm, uh, I do a variety of things, you know, a business growth expert. I'm an investor, a coach, a mentor, a consultant, even an international speaker. And I also ho host my own podcast, um, The Business Growth Show. And I guess I'll, I'll go back a little bit of where it started, where um, I grew up in Adelaide, South Australia, which is like a big country town, capital city. Um, parents are high school teachers and, you know, want to let me do well at school. And I started selling VCD movies at high school in year 10, about 15 years old. That's when my entrepreneurial journey started. And then that's when CD burners first came out for the for the slightly older people, uh, you know, there that will remember them. Um, and then towards the end of school, I didn't actually like it. And uh, I dropped out of year 12, uh, my final year. And my, my parents, you can imagine, as teachers didn't like that. Um, got a job at 18, worked my way up in a big environmental company. And then they moved me to Sydney. Um, I did a lot of great work worked in Sydney and then I was having these conversations with people about business and their degrees and things like that and I had nothing right I just worked my way up and, and then I looked around and I realized that I could get into one of the top universities here in Sydney into an MBA a master's of business administration just based on over eight years of experience working so I got to skip high school and, and the bachelor technically and I went straight into learning that and was loving it and then there was a change of management so I left and created my first business which is a waste management consulting business so I took all my knowledge from the waste and recycling industry and started working uh, with big brands and help like you know Westfield shopping centers save millions of dollars a year came out and target you know department stores saving millions a year and um, you know with different recycling opportunities and cost savings other things like that this episode is brought to you by start with values if you'd like to reduce stress and increase fulfillment in your work and life then check out startwithvalues.com. There, you'll be able to download the Values app, which helps you to discover your core values and bring them to life through micro habits. There is a Values course so that you can learn about the science and practice of core values, and you'll be able to pre-register for my forthcoming book called Start With Values. I hope that these tools will enable you to achieve more fulfillment and make more meaningful decisions on your journey of life. Now back to the episode. And then I'd go to networking events and people would just ask me a question and be like, oh, Ethan, what do you think about this business problem? I'm like, why don't you do one, two, three, four, five? And they're like, that's really good. I need to write that down. Can you tell me that again? And this would happen multiple times. So I realized I had a very good strategic brain, a very good memory to connect dots from my own business experience, from my MBA, from my coaches and mentors. So I started business coaching mentoring as well. Um, so first business has been going for over seven and a half years, still going. Um, the business coaching mentoring, I started towards the end of 2019, just before COVID. So a lot of virtual things. I've spoken all over the world, you know, multiple times in front of thousands of people in Los Angeles, as well as my own events uh, here in Australia, um, and really helping business owners that, um, you know, really wanting to just take, grow and scale to the next level, and really create the wealth and freedom they desire. Anyone from early stage businesses to six, seven, even eight figure businesses that I've helped there. So that's been really awesome. Um, completed my MBA, did all of that. And, um, and then also, yeah, started my podcast towards the start of COVID and um, like you've been going strong over 200 episodes, you know, every week for over four years and uh, really enjoying, or enjoying that journey as well. And, and then now looking at how can we take it to the next level in business? So not just having one business, which we want to do really well and grow up and, you know, multiple businesses, multiple income streams and, you know, building something that's much bigger than that, um, you know, to have a big exit or to really create, you know, the life that you want um, in the end. So that's the little quick version about me and my journey. Excellent. I love it. 
So do you think it's realistic that people should perhaps consider having more than one business nowadays? It used to be kind of like one business. If you're brave enough to take that leap, that's you for at least 10, 15, 20 years. But the reality is with technology, we can start to create multiple streams. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really important to have multiple streams of income. And that's that's two-prong approach. One within the business as well as then in multiple businesses. So some people might only sell one product or something, maybe two, you know, sometimes, but it's like, how can you maximize what you sell within the business? Because what happens if something disrupts that, right? That you've got other ways of making money. Um, And then it's also then multiple businesses. And I think, you know, COVID was a good testament to this where, you know, I was getting a lot of traction in one business and then one business sort of, you know, the whole industry changed, right? For everybody overnight, you know, in, in plus or, you know, positive or negative ways. So, you know, if you've got multiple businesses, if an industry is disrupted more than another industry, you got a bit of a fallback option there just in case something happens. And if you want to be really strategic, you could be having multiple businesses that are very linked to each other that maybe feed into each other and then create something that's even better, right? So what if one business is feeding the other, for example, or just, you know, in areas that you really enjoy um, so that you can, you know, help more people that way. So I think it's, you know, I like that. Some people might just want to stick to one thing, but I think for a risk management perspective and for more of an, you know, building a, an empire, a kingdom, what you want to call it, where you've got more and doing more on your own terms, I think it's really necessary um, there um, so that you start to think more like an investor, that you're mm. not just running a business. It's like, how am I growing something there, this business, as well as other things, so I don't have to be working and, you know, time for money necessarily and making, you know, money and time work for me. There are many business owners and entrepreneurs who listen to this podcast. Uh, For someone out there who is really trying to grow and scale, any tips, tools, recommendations? Where where should someone start? And there are many, many different philosophies on business growth, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I've got an MBA background, so I, I think you got to understand like all these key areas of business, right? And I have my, I guess, my nine keys to business growth mastery. So I, I would say that you need to upskill yourself, either learning yourself or get coaches and mentors to help you in these nine areas. Number one is mindset, um, because even though we can teach you all the same strategies and tactics, everyone's going to get different results because everyone's got a different mindset and different limiting beliefs and things growing up. Um, then from there, you've got strategy and planning. So these are the key foundational elements. What's the strategy of the business? What's the planning side of things? Then as you want to grow, um, you want to work on your branding, your marketing, and your, and your sales, understanding those key areas, which are, you know, sales is probably the most important, but they all feed into each other um, there well. And then it's your, your numbers, your systems, and your leadership. So understanding numbers is important. What systems? So it's not just, you know, people working. The systems are working for you. And then leadership's a big one because, you know, you could you know, you can build technically a six-figure business by yourself, but realistically, you want others to help you, right? And you've got to be a good leader for others to want to follow you, being part of that, that vision and mission that you're doing um, in that business there. So you've got to really understand all of these areas. And I think that's where a lot of business owners – um, fail, right? I think the stats that I was looking at that 1.8% of businesses last longer than 10 years, right? Which wow. is a crazy stat. Yes. So, you know, and, and I think it's because they don't have the knowledge in all these areas. Maybe they've got a, a skill or something like they've learned, you know, a skill, like they're a technical skill. Like, yeah, I just want to, I've, I've worked for someone, now I want to start my own business, but I don't understand all these other areas and then wonder, oh, it's a bit harder to get clients than I thought. Oh, my cash flow, you know, all these other areas that come into business. So I think, You've got to upskill yourself in all of these areas so you can make better decisions and also, you know, upgrade your mindset because, you know, there's a lot of things that likely are holding you back that you can't necessarily find out yourself. You need, you need a coach, mentor, or someone externally to bring that out with you and help you to overcome that, um, to go to that next level. So I think these are a lot of the key foundations that, that I see um, that a lot of people, yeah, once implemented, can really help you grow and scale. And there's a lot of other, you know, strategies and tactics that can go from there. You know, for example, if I was going to say one, you know, grow and scale tactic that can make a massive difference in your business, that would be partnerships. So think about how can I find other people that have a similar market to me that, you know, we can go together. We don't compete right? And how can we put something together? And if they've already got a lot of, you know, your same clients, but offer something different and you've got the same and you can share clients, or maybe you can bring an offer together, um, that can really exponentially grow your business instead of just getting clients yourself through standard, you know, marketing and sales channels there. So I think partnerships is a really big one. So trying to find other people that, you know, you can work together 
and feed each other, so to speak. So I, I mentioned that before in terms of buying businesses like that or having multiple businesses, but maybe you can start a partnerships in that way as well. And uh, yeah, be really profitable um, if you can really structure those deals correctly. Yeah. Great tips. So as an entrepreneur, you're not potentially going to master every aspect, but you do need to be a generalist who is at least competent in all of those dimensions. Otherwise, you know, if you are purely focused on technology and you've got no sales and brand, it's not going to work. You at least need to become, okay, of course you can get external resources to help you on that journey, but really at the end of the day, you need to have some knowledge. Yeah. And one thing I'll add to that, it's definitely a great point is that um, you need to know enough. So if you're going to outsource your marketing, for example, which a lot of people would do like to get, you know, help them to get leads, you need to know enough about marketing. So if you're vetting the person, ask yeah. them the right questions to see, do they actually know what they're talking about? Because a lot of people mm. have been burnt <laughs> with marketing agencies, right? Going, yeah. oh, they didn't get me any leads and I've spent all these thousands or tens of thousands of dollars or whatever that is for that, right? So you need to know enough to go, does this person really know what they're talking about, right? In that they're or even when the campaign's going, you know enough to go, have you checked this? Have you checked that? Show me these numbers, right? In that area there, instead of just hoping that they're going to get it done. So I, I think it's really important to outsource. You don't need to be the expert in all these areas, but you need to know enough. So when you're bringing people on, you know, outsourcing things so that you can make the right decision to get them in or, you know, to change things ongoing as well. You mentioned mindset. <clears throat> what is your definition of a mindset? And is it about also deconstructing some of those limiting beliefs, which we've all got? Uh, and and when that when you do dismantle them, you're like, wow, I had no idea like, I could actually achieve what I've achieved. Um, what, what else is it? Is it growth mindset? Any other thoughts? Uh, growth mindset is definitely the way we want to do because um, we don't want to have a fixed mindset. And there's, there's a, a few elements to mindset that I want to say. So firstly, we've got a lot of, all of us have limiting beliefs and a lot of them happen actually in the first seven years of our life. Um, mm. So we're not conscious of them. They're in our un unconscious mind. And this is from our parents or people that helped us grow up and they probably just did things that their parents did to them because it's the standard you know, um, program, so to speak. So they weren't necessarily aware of what they were doing, but they might give you some limiting beliefs. Like, you know, I know one that I had to change that my dad said hundreds of times that I remember growing up, even when I was older, was like, money is the root of all evil. Imagine hearing that hundreds of times, right? Like, yeah. you know, that, that plays a factor on how your relationship to money is. Um, so when I realized this, I had to change that and saying maybe lack of money is a root of all evil or money is energy, money is great, like whatever it is, right, that's going to work, that changes that belief over time. And depending on how ingrained it is to you will depend on how quickly you can change that. And a simple you know, strategy that you can do is when it, we all get negative thoughts to some extent, right, that pop in our mind. Maybe you say like, you know, business is hard, it pops up and then you might be like, okay, I just, I just caught it, I'm aware of it now. Um, what's the opposite of that? What do I want to believe about business? Business is easy. Business is fun. You know, I'm a master of business. Whatever it works, stack these things on that you want to believe in the present tense, which is important. So like I am language. Um, don't think of it in the future because it will always be in the future. You've got to believe it in the present. Um, and then you know, I write them down in a note. This is what I used to do when I first started. Write them down in like a note in my phone. And I would tell these things to myself every day um, to re-script myself over time. And depending on how ingrained it is will depend on how it changes. And eventually, your unconscious mind will go, oh, Ethan believes this now, right? Brad believes mm -hmm. this now. So this is what I'm going to do. And then the outside world changes because, you know, if I, I don't want to go too deep here, but there's quantum physics, right, um, is, is an area which is um, a powerful topic, you know, look into it to yourself for quantum physics, but basically everything's energy around us and it's all intention. Yeah. So when we yeah. put something out to the, you know, to the universe or to the world, that's what we attract from the intention. It all comes on there of the, what we observe and what we intend in there. So um, once we change those, those scripts in our mind, then we will be able to attract different things to us because our intentions are different consciously and especially unconsciously because over 95% happens unconsciously from what we do. So that's, that's from that, that growth mindset perspective that I think we all need to be focusing on. Um, and then always always look to upgrading it. Like mindset is never, oh, I've, I've fixed a few beliefs and I think I'm good now. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like learning. It's like a never ending thing that is a great thing to go, how can I keep upgrading? And then, you know, from, if you want to talk bigger level than mindset, it actually comes down to identity. Because then 
how do I see myself now? Are you still the person that works for someone? Are you the business owner? Are you more of like an investor? What's this identity that you want to do? And these are bigger shifts. And then what are the beliefs that support that identity across the journey as you're growing you know, in your business journey as well? So these are some other factors that you need to be thinking about to really help yourself get to that next level. And then you know, you'll attract different people um, to work with or partner with or help along the journey too. Mm, I really, uh, I'm with you on the, the quantum side. Uh, I've read a lot of Joe Dispenza books and it's compelling, right? And the power of language to anchor us back into the present moment. So instead of, I want to be fit, I mean, that's, it's not very inspiring, but I am a fit person and just start doing stuff, atomic habits approach. It, it at least gets you moving in the right direction and opens up opportunities and you see patterns that you may not have seen otherwise. I think that's the key. Yeah, definitely. Great books, great people. Love Joe and Tommy Habits. Great book yeah. there. And, and it, Habits take, you know, can take 60 to 90 days, right, as well to, you know, instill in yourself. So don't expect the change tomorrow, right, with what you're doing with something. You need to, you know, constantly be feeding yourself. Um, and that's another thing with mindset is is about mind feeding. Are you feeding yourself good things? Are you just listening to the radio when you're driving in the car or are you listening to a podcast like this or an audio book or something like that that's actually feeding you with positive things um, that's going to help you with your mind and, and staying away from the negative people because a lot of the time, you probably heard this as well, Brad, is we're one-fifth of the five people we spend the most time with, right? So yeah. our environment dictates a lot of what we do. So are you hanging around people that complain a lot, that are playing small in what they do? Because then you're going to become a part of that. Or are you hanging around people that are growth minded, that are positive, that are cheering you on, and that are, you're pushing you to be better? Um, and it sometimes, you know, it's like I distance myself, or you, some people say fire people from your life. I don't fire them, I just sort of drift from them over mm. time, or I might not get back to them. And I'd rather not hang around people that are negative and have maybe one, two, three people that I hang around with rather than having five and some of them are really disrupting the way that I am and, and bringing me down in that way there. So I think that's really important. Who you hang around will determine yeah, who you're going to become. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Did you ever have anyone in your journey who kind of laughed at your vision for the future? I certainly have. I remember someone laughing at me when I said one day I was going to write books, L literally laughing in my face. And that actually provided a little bit of fuel for the fire to say, okay, wait, it, it, it will happen at some point. How important is that? You know, or did you find that in your journey? Yeah, definitely. I love that story. And I completely agree, right? Fuel to the fire. Um, that's how you use it, you know, to create something. There was definitely two. So when I, when I dropped out of school, my dad said that I'll never be able to study, right? My dad mm. had three degrees. Um, and one of my teachers said, I'll never be successful. Right? Can you imagine that? A 17-year-old, you just say you'd never be successful, right? So I, I played a lot of sport growing up. I won a lot of championships in like soccer and tennis. That I, was, you know, I was never the more naturally gifted, right? like the Messi or something of soccer. Um, I was more like the Ronaldo where I built myself into a very good player. I wasn't naturally talented maybe as some of the other guys, but I would make myself one of the best players on the team because I would put the most effort in right, into what I do and I was the most driven um, in that team. And I think that's the way that it is in this business. It's like, well, watch me, right? I, I will show you that I'll be able to do it. So, you know, I went out there, you know, worked with a lot of the biggest brands in Australia, um, you know, create a lot of awesome results with, you know, thousands of business owners to, to be successful on the business side. And then even though it was very difficult for me to study, I went back and completed the MBA. And that was the first time my dad was actually proud of me. Not that I've worked with all these big businesses and these business success. Um, it was the MBA, funnily enough, um, that because he's in the old school um, type of mentality. And whether or not you need one, you know, I, I like to try and tell people there's a bit of fluff and everything in the MBA, but I'll, I'll take you the, you know, the gold part so you don't have to do a whole one myself, uh, you know, when I help my clients. Um, but those were two things that really drove me, um, you know, to go, well, I'll show you that I can be successful and will continue to be. Um, I'm almost thinking that I might need somebody else to tell me something that I can't do something now and maybe that will help me go to another level as well. <laughs> uh, I can help with that if you need. <laughs> you can't achieve that goal, Ethan. Um, no, that's, uh, thanks for sharing. I, I think you've got two options in those situations. One is to believe what the person tells you or one is to just say, well, I'll show you and, and move away. As you said, you are the common denominator. So do you want to hang out in that group of people who's telling you, you can't achieve. And in fact, I heard a story recently about 
a young guy who was working on yachts in the Mediterranean. And he told everyone that he was going to be a, a DJ one day. And everyone just laughed at him. And they were saying, yeah, don't worry. All five copies of your album will be purchased by us five on the boat, blah, blah, blah. He didn't believe them. He didn't listen. And he went on to become one of the biggest DJs in Africa, uh, which is fantastic. You know, I celebrate people's success. It's amazing. And it fires me up. So I think it's a really important message just to be aware of what you're consuming and who it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I'll just add is that, you know, what we learn in NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming, you know, around yeah. mindset that I'm a master practitioner in is that everything is just a reflection so when people are saying that you can't do something, it's actually them that yeah. they can't do it a lot of the time. So just being aware mm -hmm. of that and having some, I guess, some empathy or just some awareness going, that's okay. Well, if you believe that that can't happen, that's fine. That's your belief. But this is what I believe and this is what I'm going to do in that area there. So you can do a little reframe and then it's up to you on you know, how you move forward with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about branding. What are your thoughts on building a brand that works? Yeah, I love branding. Um, you know, I think there's a great saying because people are like, oh, I just want marketing, marketing. But branding is really where it starts as the key foundation because if you don't have a good brand, your marketing is not really going to work that well. As a great saying one of my coaches told me is that marketing is the engine and branding is the fuel, right? So understanding, it's a really great line there. So, And there's two types of brands, right? You've got a personal brand and a business brand. We all have a personal brand, whether it's just a social media profile or you're building it out to be something much bigger than that, you know, in your presence. And then you've got your business brand um, there as well, which, you know, a specific name for your business. So understanding that there are both and that, you know, in the end, people buy people as well. So I, I think our personal brand is becoming more and more important now these days and it differentiates us, especially if you, as you start to think bigger, like I'm talking about with multiple businesses, because when I had all this success in my first business, then, you know, when I started doing my business coaching, mentoring, speaking, I was building my personal brand. I could translate the other experience there, right, that I've done, uh, especially if you're looking at exiting, you want to make sure you're building a personal brand because then, you, you know, you're already, you can easily move into something else instead of just stopping and then you've got no presence whatsoever. So think ahead, right, in terms of what you're doing. And that's like strategic thinking, many moves ahead in business um, in terms of what you're doing. So I think your personal brand is really important to differentiate you because people buy people, they don't buy products and services. And then at the same time, build a business brand. Um, if it's you know something specific that you're doing that you can link to that. Um, but if you look at online with, um, let's use Elon Musk that everybody knows, right? Um, you know, Elon Musk has like 10 to 100 times the amount of followers than Tesla does, right? Or some of the other business brands that he has. So even though it's important to have the business brand, it's actually the personal brand that is there that creates the most impact and that you can do the most with and it is flexible. So if you want to start something different, that's the area there. And my wife has a branding agency, so that helps to make me look good um, in that area there with branding. But I think it's really important to understand what those foundations are. How do you want to be perceived? Because branding is all about emotion, how you're being perceived. And then once you have that perception, then it's like, okay, what can you do with that? How can you market to that perception from there? Mm. I'm seeing more and more people, even in big corporates like consulting firms, who are developing a personal brand. And it seems like the consulting firm is supportive of that because they know that having strong personalities within their umbrella benefits the whole organization, thought leaders as such. So if you're building a personal brand and you've got a great one, props to your wife and your, yourself for, for this, links in the show notes, by the way, for anyone who wants to check them out. Um, what are some of the key steps in, in, in conceptualizing and building a brand? So as you said, figure out the problem that you're solving and how you want to be perceived. Anything else? Yeah, definitely. Like thinking about the problem and a lot of it comes down to the messaging, right? So that's that's where the real brand foundation. So what's the strategy? Who you want to be helping? Now, is it a is it a personal brand or business brand? But if it's a personal brand, do you do multiple things? So it's like, how do you, what's the overarching like purpose, right? And the vision of that, that mm -hmm. you want to do? Because a lot of the time, that can extend across multiple businesses. So what's the, what's the deeper, higher level essence that you want to be communicating to people yep. there? Then, you know, you can... I think that's the real key part, right? And a lot of the time you need somebody to put you through a process. Like I still did it with my wife. I did the process where she asked me all these questions, right? To then 
because it's it's a bit hard to like look at a form and just do it. You need someone yeah. to sort of dig deeper in on you. So that's why I recommend getting someone externally um, to do that with you. And they really extract all this gold out of you. And then it's like, you know, workshop. This can take multiple hours, right, to, to yeah. do this in one hit. And then once you extract all this gold, then it's like, okay, how do we then – show this visually and how do we communicate this you know across all your mediums whether it's websites social media you know other areas like that that you want to showcase the brand and how do we then portray that visually and then you've got other things like colors and things like that that um mm. have certain you know um ways of you know focusing if you want trust if you want these other areas of what the color means um, but i think it's really that messaging and that strategy i'll give a story what one of my wife says she gets a lot of ad agencies so my wife has the branding agency she partners with marketers right that are experts so she'll she'll bring the right marketer in depending on the project um, but a lot of ad agencies come to her and say hey we need you to do the branding messaging because the ads won't work if we don't do this first because they don't have it Whereas a lot of other marketing agencies will probably just go, oh yeah, we can do the ads, we can do it. And they wonder why they don't get results, right? Because the the branding messaging is where it all stems from. So mm -hmm. don't discount branding because a lot of people think, oh, I can't, I just want to get an ROI, I put a dollar into marketing, get $3 out. But no. you know, you're not going to get anything out or very minimal ROI or the branding will actually increase. And I think there was a stat in Forbes that said of the brand... I think it was about 20% of the value of the company is based on the brand, right? So there's something that's a little bit more quantifiable about how much the brand is actually worth. Mm, and we live in the attention economy. So a strong, robust brand with the brand voice that resonates, that's a real asset. And that's something that I've worked on for many years. So my background has been quite varied, but uh, when I've supported other businesses, getting that brand right. I, I've worked with people who said, it's a bunch of nonsense. A website's a website. And I said to that particular person, why do you wear a nice suit when you go into meetings? It's exactly the same reason. Why not go in yeah. your pajamas? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. right? Un unconscious perceptions, right, of people. And I've always worn like a, a suit and shirt. I used to have a tie when I first started at 18, but I've, I've removed the tie um, a little bit more recently. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of yeah. um, unconscious biases, right, of people. One of them is is how you dress. If you rock up in a t-shirt and shorts to a big business yeah. meeting, you know, there's yeah. going to be perceptions there to change. Um, <laughs> and it's also, it's also to do with partnering. So, you know, when I talked earlier about yeah. partnering, right, partnerships is a big thing. So your personal brand and your perception about you will determine what type of partners you get because they'll be like, is Ethan or Brad worth partnering with, especially with very successful people? If you really wanted to partner with someone that's big, a lot of the time they will only partner if your brand seems on point or above their brand in how it's being yeah. perceived. So the positioning of your brand is really important as you start to think bigger and go, who's someone big that I can partner with? They'll be like, is it actually worth it, right? To do it there from a perception perspective, even if you may not have you know, the same level of like success technically in that particular area, but there's other things that you can bring as long as you're perceived on a similar level. That's when it starts to become really, really important because, you know, if you've got a, a million dollar business that makes a million dollars a year, let's just say, you know, what if you could do a partnership that makes you a million dollars a month, right? It's just going to change the game, right? Ongoing there with one partnership yep. that would take you a lot, a lot longer to build that within your current business. So this is the type of things that I'm opening people's minds, I guess, about what's possible when you do build your brand. Yes. Marketing. What are some tips for people who want to grow and market their business more effectively? Yeah. So there's, I guess, three key areas of marketing, right? That we need to be thinking about. So firstly, it comes down to capturing, right? So a lot of people just think I've got to put things out there, but we've got to capture the lead, right? Like there. So how are you getting their details? Because you know, if someone just comes to your website and you look at your Google Analytics and it says, oh, 100 people visited my website, great. That doesn't really yeah. grow your business, right? Yeah. That's just yeah. nice um, to know or a thousand, whatever the number is, right, that come to your website. So we need to be able to capture that lead. So what are you offering to people, whether it's on a website, a landing page, a funnel or whatever, to get their details? What are you offering, you know, for free that can do? And a lot of the time it's like a lead magnet as it's called, where, you know, let's say you've got an ebook or, you know, some sort of checklist or something that's, you know, you can offer people, maybe it's a little short video training that is valuable going, oh, wow, yeah, I, I love that. Um, I'll give you my, my name and email, potentially phone number, depending on what it is. Um, and that way they'll get it. And then that allows you to then nurture them the second phase, right? So nurturing that lead, because the stats are that, especially now it's getting more and more, you can take up to 20 touch points 
for us to convert somebody into a client. That's a lot, right? So how are we getting those touch points? If it's a referral, it's a little bit different. There's a lot more trust there. You know, that's why people like referrals. Um, the thing is that building a business based just on referrals is challenging because what happens if you get no referrals that month or for the next yeah. three months, right? You don't have a business basically, right? You got to get leads another way. So referrals are, are good to be the cream. It's like, oh, these are easy sales. People are referring me. But ideally you have, think of marketing like a chair. A chair has four legs. So you should ideally have at least four ways of attracting leads into your business, right? That way there. Maybe one is ref referrals. Maybe one is through a lead map. Maybe one is through like events, whether it's webinars or seminars. Like whatever it is, right? You've got a few different ways to attract leads into your business. That way, if one falls over or doesn't do as well, it doesn't matter because you've got other systems that are going just like the multiple income streams and the risk management, the marketing, you know, risk management is that you have multiple ways of attracting people to, you know, clients and prospects into your, your system there. Then you nurture them along the journey, could be through messages, through emails, um, you know, through texts, through other ways that you do that. And then, you know, from there, then it's about converting them, right? That comes more into a, a sales strategy of getting them down the line of, you know, having maybe it's a conversation unless you've got an, you know, an e-commerce type of store, then it might be an online thing. Uh, but if it's a service-based business, then it might be having a conversation if it's a, if it's a bigger level and, and moving them along that journey. But I would just say is, yeah, make sure you've got multiple ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, and, and that takes time as well. So just go through that. Now, yes, you may need to, you know, understand enough about it. You may want to outsource, but I heard that there's a stat that um, if you if your marketing is outsourced, your business is actually worth a lot less because what happens if something happens with that company, that marketing or anything like that? That's exactly how you grow the business, right? So um, yes, especially at the start when you're learning, you can outsource things, but eventually as you learn more, you can start to bring things in-house for certain of these legs of the chair that we're talking about. And then the big business, you're not susceptible to other external people you, you control. Um, you know, certain marketing funnel and leads from there. In the changing context of marketing, what are your thoughts on channels like paid ads and search engine optimization? I mean, for me personally, SEO has always worked really well, but that's because I'm good at writing content. So I can write great content that will rank super well in search engines. And that's brought some of the best leads I've ever had. Of course, AI is changing that and we can talk about AI later on specifically uh, paid ads and things like this. I I'm not seeing much ROI, but I guess it depends on the product. Yeah, it's a great question. And the way I see there's three ways to really grow a business, right? You've got organic means, you've got paid like advertising means, and you've got partnerships. We've already talked about partnerships. You know, organic means are things like SEO, like you said, or maybe there's organic social media posting. There's other ways that you're not necessarily paying, right, for that. You're just putting good content out there and then people will find you ideally, yeah, yeah maybe through Google, through an SEO article or like that. Um, and there's different ways. And I think, yes, um, that is more, I guess, of a long-term game, right? Yes. Unless you've got a really very unique thing that you post and, you know, not many people are doing it and you, you're sort of mastering that space, but it can be a bit of a long-term game. And I think this is why people don't like it as much. They try and go down the paid ads route because they're like, they just want it now. Um, whereas when you're building a brand and when you want to, you know, have people that, are, you know, want to follow you, you need to build that trust over time. We talked about yeah. the 20 touch points. This is where the articles, you know, the blogs, the SEO, the, the social media posts, the, the email, you know, that you send to your clients. This is where it's really important to do that as you build your database, right? In ideally a CRM and you, you know, you move that across in that area there. So I think it's great. It just can take some time, but if you do it right, then you're really positioned in a very powerful way organically. Then you've got the paid ad strategy, which is like, I want it now. That can be beneficial in some ways. Now you've got to really know what you're doing. Um, you know, there's different strategies for different businesses. So if I was to quickly do it, like Facebook and Instagram or Meta, they're probably the lowest cost per lead for a lot of yeah. businesses, right? To do it there, you just got to know what you're doing. Um, then you've got like YouTube ads, which are probably next. If you're good at video, you could do YouTube ads. You know, you could do things like TikTok ads potentially, um, but LinkedIn ads are, are very expensive. So I wouldn't yeah. do that. LinkedIn is a bit more of an organic strategy using like sales navigator and things like that to find the right people. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is, is Google ads, right? So that's instead of doing the, the SEO, you know, organic way, the Google ads is like trying to, you know, obviously get to the top of the page very quickly. And especially for, for physical businesses or people where they search a lot, you know, if it's a plumber or something like that, then Google ads can be 
can do very well um, in those areas there. But normally, I say Facebook, Instagram, um, and there's different ways of targeting people in there. Um, the question is, is depending on your niche, depending on how you target, depending on the cost per lead, is it worth it um, on what you're offering um, down that track? Um, but you know, but if you're filling an event, let's just say, right, a lot of people might want to do webinars or or seminars and things. Depending how big your list, if you have a small list of people, organic marketing, you may only get a small amount of people into that area there. But if you want to fill, you know, 100 people or more into that area, you probably need paid ads to get them because these are new people because you just don't have that database yet. So I think if you don't have, you know, you should be building that over time with your marketing where you're capturing the lead and you can remarket to them. Um, paid ads is a strategy to sort of quicken that. And there's a lot of testing that happens in marketing. Marketing is not an art. Um, and so be aware that you're going to invest a lot over a lot of months to, and if it's, you know, whether it's yourself or, or an aid agency, you need to do a lot of testing to see what's going to work. And that could cost a lot of investment. So it's more of a, mm-hmm. still a long-term thing. Don't just expect one month, you put this in, you're going to make all this money. It doesn't work like that. You've got to see what works in a lot of different types of ads and, and strategies, and then work out, um, you know, what we need to double down on from there. So I think that's the, the other method of it is, um, be willing if you're going to do it to to keep investing in it. You've got enough cash flow to really master that. Because if you can master paid ads um, eventually, you know when when you work through that, it can be very profitable. Because you could say I put one dollar in here, I get five dollars out there, and you just put the money in and it works. But it might take you a few months, six months, and a lot of thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, to test that right before getting to that point potentially, depending on your your niche and what you do there. Mm, excellent. That's very clear. So sales, you mentioned is perhaps the most important uh, aspect of business growth. Now, sales for some people is a dirty word, like, oh, salespeople. But I've always, I, I sell naturally because I'm passionate about what I do. So I've never thought of myself as a salesperson, yet I have a pretty good rate when it comes to selling workshops or um, resilience training programs or whatever else it might be. Um, what are your thoughts on sales in our, again, in our changing world, some of the old tactics I'm seeing not work as well as they used to. Yeah, definitely. Sales is definitely evolving and yeah, most important skill because you could have the best product or service in the world and there's a lot of people out there that want to need it. But if you can't sell it, then everybody loses basically, right? You don't have a business. So, you know, sales is really important. Like you said, I think there's some mindset things where, you know, there's been some sleazy salespeople, maybe it's the car salesman or something else where you're feeling pressured, right? The old school tactics mm. that um, give you a bit of a bad situation. So I think that's tarnished some people. It's a great line that people don't like to be sold to, people love to buy, right? So that's, the, the, that's how we totally. need to understand, right? You don't want to make someone feel like you're selling to them. You want to make, get them into a buying frame of mind. And this is where, you know, there's certain... Um, reverse selling methods, as they're called, right, is how can you turn it to a fact where you're asking great questions and getting the person to buy into what you're doing instead of just saying, hey, buy this now. It's like, hey, this is what I can do or, you know, why would you like to to work with me? Why should I work with you? You know, you start to flip the script a little bit in terms of getting people to say, yeah, I do want to work with you, right, in that area there. So I think that's it there. And, and one one mindset element is sales is more about serving, right? It's about serving the other person. How can I serve this person in the best possible way. So if you're getting on a call or a a conversation is working out, I'm here to serve this person. Maybe I can't offer them something, right? Like in in what I'm doing, but you're just finding out what they need help with. Maybe you're going to connect them with somebody else and then, you know, get some good karma if you believe in that, where it will come back to you in another way right from there. But if you're there to serve the person, really help them and really delve deeper, um, dig deep into what they, because what, people say their problems are not normally the problems. There's normally, that's the surface level. There's normally deeper things. And if you understand mm-hmm. the deeper areas there, if you can solve them, ideally yourself, maybe it's with your partners, maybe it's someone else, then you'll get someone that really loves what you do and, and, and can sell you know, from there. So I think that's the, the mentality that we need with sales. You need to you know, build rapport with someone initially. Let's call it right. You don't want to um, you know, just try and sleep with someone on the first date unless you were, you know, you're really young. Back then, you know, people want to be wined and dined you know, for, for many uh, you know, uh, areas there with dates before you, know, before you get to the point of, of connecting much deeper. It's like sales as well, right? So don't go straight in. Build a relationship, build some rapport, dig on the challenges, right, of what they're doing. And then you also need to qualify people. Because sometimes, you know, 100 leads, if, if 90 of them are pretty not the right leads and pretty average or not 
ready for you right now, then it's a waste of chatting to all these people, right? So sometimes there needs to be a qualification or even a disqualification um, there where you're saying, if you don't fit these areas, then yeah. you know there's no point in us having a conversation. So that's, you know, started thinking on a bigger level of qualifying people before you, you go to that sales conversation. And then you can work out, you know, this is the best next step for you. And if you think even bigger, when we talk about multiple streams of income, maybe you have an initial offer that you do where people get into, but maybe then there are more offers that you offer later down the track, right? This is the next step for you, the next step. So it's a, you know, selling them into those, those high level programs or other products and services about what you offer from there, thinking ahead as well. Mm. And for a business that is reaching the point where they would like to get an ex a salesperson to come in-house, uh, any tips for finding the right person? Is it to test values? Is it uh, alignment with the product or service? Is it uh, passion about that type of business? Any, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think generally about hiring people, there needs to be you know a values alignment. Now, you don't necessarily have to ask someone there's a value, but the biggest thing when hiring is like the attitude, right? A lot of people just think skills. Do they have the skill? Have they done sales mm -hmm. before? But it's more attitude because you can have a toxic person. I've heard people that had like the best sales per person in their organization, uh, but they were toxic, right? And they were infecting. I think one toxic person can infect up to 300 people in an organization, right? That's how crazy the stats are there. Crazy. So um, they were the best salesperson. Now, all the other sales people weren't doing well. But you know what was funny? When they removed that salesperson from the business, everyone did really well. And the business like went five times, you know, the, the sales after that. So it's important to get the right person that has the right attitude. Um, so that's one thing. I think also understanding their personality. So doing certain personality tests to see what the type of person is. There's a lot of different ones out there. Like a simple one could be disc profiling. Uh, you might have heard of Brad and other people here, you know, with your dominant, your influential, um, the constructive, you know, detail side and the safety side. So, you know, normally people have two of those as their main drivers and then, and all of that. So understanding what they are, because more of the, the I influential person is more of a natural salesperson, let's call it there um, in terms of what you do. So they would probably, you would want them as one of the top two traits um, in the salesperson that what you do. Um, and then maybe there's there's a lot of other, you know, personality profiling and other tools out there that you could potentially use if you want to. But I think it's important to, to get in those because they ask a lot of questions and you understand the deep motivation um, that's behind that person. And then you can really find, okay, yeah, how do I how do I bring them in? And it also comes down to how you train them. You know, just expect someone like anybody in the business just to hit the ground running. Are you training them? Are they really loving, you know, what they do and even test them? Can you go in and test them sometimes to see, do a little bit of a trial, everything like that to really hire that person uh, to see if they're, they're following those instructions? Are they, can they take initiative? Are they thinking on their feet? Are they someone that's like, oh, I've always done it this way. I know what I'm doing. Or are they always learning and wanting to grow and that type of mm -hmm. growth type of mentality to do better, especially if, um, you know, you've got these new sales techniques you're learning, um, you want to pass those on and they're going to actually implement that as well. Excellent. Systems. What are your thoughts on building robust systems to support business growth? Yeah, systems are really key um, because humans, we can have human error, right? No one's perfect there. So um, you want something, ideally, a system that people can work with that does repeatable tasks and it does them perfectly every time. So instead of having, you know, five people to do something, you might not only need one or two because the systems are doing all of the other work. Um, you know, without talking about AI, if I just talk about general systems now, you know, there's a lot of systems in our business that are really key. There might be like a CRM, a customer relationship management system. So how are you capturing that lead that we talked about in the marketing, you know, stage there and then to remarket to them and put them through a client journey, so to speak, like this is the step, this is the step that we want to pull them through to make them become a client and, and deliver on that client um, you know, you might need things like project management tools. How are you managing your projects and your tasks with you and your team, even if it's by yourself, but then especially as you're building a team. So it's this cohesion there, um, you know, depending on if you've got, um, you know, Google or Microsoft, you know, with your emails, you've got different cloud, you know, softwares to have your cloud systems. There's so many different systems out there that you can do, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Zoom, all these other areas there to, to focus on your business. I think it's understanding what's going to make a big impact. Um, and how can you automate things? And there's a lot more of these sort of all-in-one systems that are coming out now as well, which I think are good because sometimes it used to be I needed 20 systems to run my business and I've got to try and use something like Zapier to try and connect them all to yeah. APIs so they talk to each other. Whereas now 
systems are starting to put more features in the one system. Now, it might not be one system for your whole business, but you might need only up to, say, five systems, let's call it, which have a lot of features within them that make it easier for you um, to run the business without having to, like, yeah, patch things together, so to speak, because that's when you get really true um, yeah, results because you can look at it, the data as a whole or the information as a whole and go, what decisions do we need to make from here to make the business, you know, go forward? So, um, you know, even like Zero is the accounting software. Like, you know, I think that's the, the best one that a lot of people are using now. Um, you know, so important to run, you know, your profit and loss, your balance sheets, your cash flow statements, all that, that numbers side of things. So systems really integrate in every department. Um, so learn to love them. And then, then the next level is, I guess, is AI from there is like, how can you integrate that as well, which can even, you know, enhance the system even more. Mm. Let's, let's talk a little bit about AI and uh, how it's changing business. Personally, in my life, it is a game changer in terms of synthesizing concepts, dumping a whole load of data and getting something meaningful back out of it. It saves me, I don't know, countless hours per week. What are your thoughts about uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, founders bringing AI into their business? Yeah, I think it's essential. Uh, and mm. The stats are that in five to 10 years, there's going to be two types of business owners, business owners that are utilizing AI and other business owners have gone out of business basically yeah. because they haven't utilized AI. So, uh, you know, if you can make, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm going to make people redundant. I have to fire people or maybe people that are working for entrepreneurs are thinking, you know, my job's going to be redundant. Don't think like that. Think like you could make the person double efficient, right? In the business, you, you, you know, Brad talked about um, how many hours, right? Is, um, you know, he's saving there. Imagine you could get someone in their daily tasks, they're using things and they could get double the amount of output. So you don't even have to hire someone else. And all of a sudden yeah. you could double your business, you know, um, you, you know, capacity in terms of doing things there. So that's the, the type of mindset that we need to be thinking. Now, a lot of people think just chat GPT um, with, you know, which is great, right? Um, especially the paid version I recommend because you can do a lot yeah. more with that, um, with just the data um, quickness and, and how good it is as well as like Dali, the image creator and and all these other things with with ai um so i definitely you know have a play i would just say is start to use it daily like how can you use it to come up with ideas come up with content to create pictures like you know to get ideas to maybe ask someone a question on a podcast it could be anything right so think about how can you use it for there and then there's a lot of other specific ais um that you know, you can get that help specific things where maybe, you know, I've got one that helps to to cut videos, right? Little snippets of video, like, you know, with my podcast and things like that, you know, areas there. So you've got a lot of these other programs that are just speeding it up. You know, my, my um, VA, you know, and, and, you know, which used to do it would take her hours. Now the video does it automatically. Now it's just quick and, you know, you would just be able to check it and um, yeah. you know, it's not always perfect. And I think, you know, the, the mentality of AI is that, you know, you talked before about doing articles. You're good at copywriting with SEO. Don't just like copy paste what you get from ChatGPT into exactly. an article because they know it's AI. You're going to mm. get ranked lower and everybody knows when they read it, like it sounds like it, right? So yeah. whether you need to put it through another program, but ideally you need to adjust it. It's just a foundation and then you adjust it in your content or what you're using it for in your business. And then if you really want to go to the next level with AI, it's then you can create your own AIs, right? In there where you're creating something within your business, where it starts to look at your own information, where you can plug that in into what you've got um, and start to pull information out from there, which is really powerful. Or there's even you know, automation things that are happening. I know people that are, um, you know, investing in, you know, sort of AI developers that are um, getting emails. And like, let's say that every email you get, has a draft or automatically, you know, drafted, right? Which is pretty cool. That's where it's like heading now. And then you can adjust the draft and imagine saving hours a day into just, you know, half an hour to reply to emails just by making a few adjustments. So there's a lot of cool stuff that's happening and it's moving very fast. This is why you need to be playing with it daily and just being aware so that you can, you're not going to be left behind, you know, um, like, like many other people. Mm, I love it. And there's a couple of things there. Uh, having been an early adopter and a deep user, uh, one is if you see a blog post and it starts off with in today's fast paced world, comma, that's chat GPT. <laughs> and the, the, the other thing I'm really looking forward to is a, is an AI CRM. And I know there's CRMs with AI elements to them, but one that just watches what I do and says, that's a lead and I'm going to remember it and I'm going to remind you and put them into that funnel. Like bring it, whoever's designing that, bring that because it'll be incredible. 
Yeah, I love that. That's uh, that last one will be very key because yeah, yeah, I think I'm seeing it now with some of these all-in-one CRMs just to give people some awareness of like having AI employees, right? That they, you know, instead of hiring someone, you can get them to perform certain tasks. Let's call yes. it within your business, and they're already linked with your CRM, so maybe it's helping you to chat to them and book a call with you or something like that, right? That you're wanting to do. So that's where it's starting to become really powerful um, with with integrating AI. But yeah, that's the next level where mm -hmm. they already know what needs to happen, and then you know, giving you those recommendations or even taking the action potentially taking without you even saying anything. Yeah. Exactly. I'll I'll just put that person in a funnel designed for them and I'll send them emails at the right time and I'll let you know as soon as they're ready for a call. Come on, someone make that. <laughs> no, that's, that's, or maybe we should make that, Ethan. Maybe we should, mate. I, yeah. I like the idea. Let, let's partner and, and yeah. make this happen. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. So finally, and the last topic I'd like to talk about is leadership. Talk to me about your uh, the key principles of leadership for business growth. Yeah, leadership is so important um, because you can't build a business by yourself. You need other people to help you. And a lot of people out there that are, you know you speak to, maybe they just have jobs. They hate their job, right? A lot of the people, mm -hmm. right? They don't like the culture. They don't like these things. So I think it's our duty as the business owner, as the entrepreneur or someone that's a high level person in a business to have somewhere that people love working, right? So that there's a great culture, there's a great vision, purpose, mission, you know, values that you have there so that people love coming to work, um, they're part of something and they will do more and they'll want to stay with you. It's not about the money, right? It's about the bigger things about what you do there. So I think, you know, leadership, there's a lot of, you know, different traits that people might talk about, like leading from the front, you know, having integrity and, you know, everything, empathy and all these other areas, which are all true. Um, and I think, you know, another part of leadership is understanding how, pe how to motivate people. It's not the old school, you know, carrot and stick type of thing. If you do this, I'll give you that because that actually reduces motivation over time. Um, so understanding how to use things like social praise and other areas where it's not um, using something else or financially based to, to motivate people. It's understanding that you can praise people and actually get them to become intrinsically motivated. Um, it's a, ex extrinsic is you, external things, you know, for people that are listening that motivate you. I want that car, that house, right? Whereas intrinsic is I love what I do, so I don't need external things to motivate me. I really love what I do. And I think that's a, a key part about leadership is how to build that intrinsic motivation in people because then people will just love. And even if they get tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, do you want to come over here with more money? They will tell you and they probably won't even go because they love it so much because the grass isn't always greener on that other side. So really enhance your knowledge of leadership and how you practice it. And people do like they, they do what you do. They don't do what you say a lot of the time. So you've mm. got to be demonstrating those values um, as well in your business on, on how you want to be. And that's how you can really create a really powerful business. Walk the talk and, and, and be the change you want to see in the business. Any thoughts on delegation, especially if you're on that journey? Many founders, uh, CEOs struggle with letting go because they're worried that it won't get done well. Yeah. And there's a mindset element to that first where, you know, people say no one will do it as good as me. And that's true, actually, because yeah. we're all unique. No one is us, right? Yeah. So, you know, you've got to be aware that that's the case. So I think the mindset we need to have is people only do it 80% as good as me. Be, be good with that. Like that's expected. So once you understand there might be 80% as efficient, but if you've got you and one other person, that's now 180%, then it becomes a 260%, et cetera. It starts to multiply, right? When you get mm -hmm. all these other people and ideally you put good systems and processes in place. So it minimizes any issues or, you know, bottlenecks with you in the business. So I think one is the mindset side. They're only 80% as good as you be okay with that. Then understanding like how to delegate well because you can't just say hey go do this task and then they, they do it and you're like oh that was crap you don't know what you're doing well you didn't train them properly didn't delegate properly for them to do the task so you know one thing a little tip that i can give people especially if they're you could be anyone really but especially if they're in front of a computer is just you're doing the task anyway just record your screen use zoom or something else you know loom to record your screen and say this is what we're doing in the task right so you don't have to write a big process document you're just actually showing and talking through what you're doing and then they can write the process document on behalf of that and they've got something visual that they can refer to this is even something you could do on site with someone right with videos and things like that so i think videos is a very powerful way mm -hmm. that you can delegate things very easily without having to like create hundreds of processes before people can do something so that would be my little tip um and then once because you, you're only as good as how you train them right especially 
you know, a lot of people are getting virtual assistants now, people from overseas. Um, you know, they're like, oh, they're not doing it right. Why well, are you training them and giving them specific steps? And are you checking things and going through them and upskilling them? All these different areas there instead of just going, oh, can you write this document for me? And, and that's it, right? Yeah. So the, the, yeah. the, the depth of what you do, that extra little bit of time to train them or to do that um, delegation will save you mountains of hours and time um, down the track as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great tip. I love that. They, they might only be 80% as good as you, but that's a great thing. <laughs> uh, you know, treasure that because they're not you. And they're probably good at things that you're not good at as well. So how can people find out more and connect with you, Ethan? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, find me um, on uh, my website, ethancassiotis.com. Um, it's recently been rebranded, my personal brand. So I'd love to, to know your thoughts, but I've got a free resource on there called My Nine Keys to Business Growth Mastery. So you can get that for free. It talks about all my nine areas and gives you a lot of just gold information, very short thing there. So I recommend doing that and you can check all the other areas that I do and also on my, my social media profiles. So, you know, whether it's Facebook, um, LinkedIn, you know, Instagram, even TikTok or, or my YouTube. Um, it's all Ethan Cassiotis. It's all under my personal brand intentionally there. So um, find them out. And uh, yeah, love to have a chat with anybody, see if I can or even connect you with somebody there or, or help you with a resource that can really take the next level. And uh, and like to just say, yeah, thank you, um, Brad. Um, you know, it's been great to be on here, mate. Great host. And um, look forward to getting you on my podcast um, shortly as well. And, uh, you know, to return the favor. And um, yeah, I think it, you're putting on a great show here, mate. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Ethan, thank you so much. It feels like we've done an MBA in an hour. I love it. It's so much practical information. So thank you so much for everyone out there. Please do click the links in the show notes. We'll see you in the next episode. Ethan, thank you. Thanks, mate.